few areas that have um, been mentioned by, by uh, Neil in particular. Uh, I think what does go to show is that Switzerland is certainly far ahead of the world in uh, innovation when it comes to uh, FRP strengthening and taking the sort of the passive strengthening that we do now into very much uh, an active strengthening role. So I'm going to look at um, some of the secret FRP strengthening systems that we have available and how we can overcome some of the problems. Plus quality control and testing again, uh, on site when everything's been installed and, and while things are still being installed, and then follow that up with, uh, with some case studies. So just to recap then, I think uh, hopefully we understand now that uh, this sort of strengthening can be carried out on reinforced concrete, on masonry, somebody mentioned uh, I think diagonal um, strips on, on masonry a moment ago, uh, can be done on timber, and also we're done on cast and raw time. So quite a sort of flexible and adaptable um, uh, solution on various construction materials. It can be used to increase load capacity in the flexural shear or, or compression and uh, can improve impact resistance, resistance to seismic loading and uh, blast loading again. But it's a case of what materials do you use for what situation and hopefully that's what I'm going to cover now. So the systems we have are the, the, the carburetor systems, which are predominantly the, the plates, sort of come in 250 metre length, so you can cut them for um, any length, various widths. We've got uh, shear links, we've got ropes, and we've got near surface mounted plates and, and rods. Widths of the plates come between 50 and 150 millimetres in, uh, in width. And the thickness is between generally around about 1.2 millimetres. I've got 24 millimetres there because we actually do produce bespoke plates which are ultra high modulus for very specialist situations. But predominantly, for the standard plates that we get involved with is generally flexural strengthening. The plates are around about 1.2 millimetres in thickness. Three grades as well of the, uh, of the plates. We also have shear links, as I say, near surface mounted plates as well, rods. Then, of course, the important. Uh, is important of all the other bits and pieces is the adhesive as well. Seeker wrap system, there's um, aramids, glass fibre and also carbon fibre. Various grades we have, grade various weaves and also different laminating resins depending on whether we have a wet lay or what we call a dry lay uh, system for the fabrics as well which I'll go into more detail uh, later on. So just so if you start to look at the FRP range we have for buildings, you have the Corbidil system, probably the most popular system for strengthening uh, beams. Also we can use it for going around openings, strengthening slabs, on masonry and on, on, on concrete. Then we have the Seeker fabric system which we can use on masonry walls, we can use that for uh, seismic loading as well also for strengthening uh, beams, for wrapping the beams. We've also got the sh carbon shear system where we can look at uh, these products taking care of the, the shear at the end of beams but also ha they, have a, another, um, they have another sort of option as well which is anchoring the plates at, at the ends to take care of uh, the anti-peel side of the, the application and design. Like that. Oh, I should whip through a bit quicker than that. And then we've got um, bridges, and you can see the various systems here. The carb we've got the carbon shear system, which are the links. We've got the carbon stress system, and the normal carbon carbon door system, which are the plates on the underside, and the fabric, which we can use for confinement and uh, wrapping of, um, of of the columns. Carbon fibre um, <coughs> plates, the way that they're uh, produced, as, as uh, Neil said, they're sort of five micron uh, filaments. Uh, we use polyacrylonitrile um, filaments, PAN for short. There are other options, there's, uh, there's, there's sort of rayon and there's also pitch. But specifically for structural applications, we tend to use the PAN type of um, uh, filaments. They're put through several processes, uh, heat processes, <coughs> to be carbonised and become a carbon fibre uh, filament. 
Those filaments are then put into toes as, uh, or rovings, as Neil mentioned, and if you put a 1,000 fibres in, that's called a, a 1K toe. If it's 2,000, it's a 2K toe or, or roving. And what we tend to do is to feed those into this protrusion machine. They get fed through here, through a, through a, a dye. They then pass through <coughs> a resin, epoxy resin, which is uh, heated. And then it goes through the... Uh, the, the actual fabrication unit itself comes out the other end preformed, another heating process to really rapidly cure uh, the adhesive and then they're cut off at the end at around about 250 metres then when they appear on site taken out of the box and you can see here similar shot to Neil where they, the application just takes out the box then they will cut them but you can see they're quite versatile. They can um, sort of have two dimensions if you wanted to because they're quite thin. And, and there's ways that we train the contractor to actually make sure that we don't get any voidage between uh, the plates in, in either direction. Plus also because they're light, as you can see, just a couple of operatives compared to quite a few operatives if you were using steel plates. Plus they can be used <coughs> continuously for whatever you're trying to strengthen and, and whatever the length of the beam or span of the bridge is. Just some mechanical properties, when you start to compare carbon fibre and particularly our plates against steel, uh, three key areas is uh, elastic modulus, tensile strength and density. So you can see here with the carbodeur between 165 and 360 uh, kilonewtons per metre squared compared to steel. Tensile strength between 1100 and 3500 newtons per millimetre squared compared to 220 and 260 in steel and obviously the lightness can be seen here when you start to compare densities between sort of 1600 for, um, for carbon, 7100 for steel and give you a comparison 2400 for, uh, for concrete. So you can see the sort of the, the, um, the advantages with using carbon fibre from the practical point of view as well as the, as the sort of theoretical strengthening side as well. Three grades Standard, medium and ultra high modulus, you can see the differences there between the, uh, the modulus and the tensile strengths. Uh, range between 100 and 150 millimetres in, in uh, width and depending on um, whether it's medium or um, standard between 1.2 and 1.4 millimetres. If we start to look at how do we start to strengthen the structure for shear, then what we have are what we call preformed um, carbon shear links or legs. And they're made in exactly the same way as the carbon strips, but they at, the end of the at the end of the process, they're just curved, and these the leg lengths can come in different lengths, um, different widths. And what we tend to do is pre treat the end with the adhesive, and we tend to sort of serrate that so it gets a better bond into the adhesive so we can actually reduce the anchorage length on the, <coughs> on the carbon fibre leg itself. As you can see here, you can apply them. One you'd place, push it into the uh, pre-drill holes here, push the leg inside, you'd inject resin in there, then that would finish there, then the other one will come round, overlap around the centre, take care of shear, but again you can see how it anchors any plates there as well. And this is uh, an application, a uh, live application on a bridge where, again, same preparation to the um, concrete, also to the legs, same as to the plates, is, is you just sort of uh, use a cleaner to take the carbon, the carbon dust off the, uh, off the legs themselves, then apply the adhesive to the concrete and the legs, bring them into position, and uh, when the, where they overlap and then remove any excessive um, adhesive once the, sort of the, the plates have been pushed into place and any adhesive has been extruded out of the side. And uh, you can see we can sort of get involved with some fairly complicated configurations when it comes to, uh, to shear. Fabio's um, covered this uh, subject in... Uh, a lot of detail and far better detail than I ever would, so um, you don't really need to uh, get any more information from me on this one. Ultra-high modulus plates, I say, are normally bespoke. 
uh, plates. This um, for raw time, we tend to use these particularly for the, uh, London Underground. And although they're built up of six millimeter sort of uh, thicknesses, we actually bond them as multiple plates. But to take care of sort of reducing the stresses at the ends, we tend to taper the ends of the, of the plates. And these thicknesses can be anything up to 20, 25 millimetres in, in thickness, obviously at the centre of the, uh, of the plate. But again, still comparatively light to manhandle compared to if they were the same length in, in steel. So the actual access equipment can be sort of traditional, standard, sort of quite quick to erect aluminium towers and the plates can be installed very, very quickly. Uh, Neil mentioned now in TR55 uh, the use of near surface mounted plates and the way that these work is uh, we sort of cut a slot in the concrete trying to avoid the reinforcement that's already there of course then you fill the, the slots up with uh, adhesive or leaving just, um, just below the surface and then you apply uh, the plates uh, or the rods into the adhesive Generally the adhesive extrudes out of the top and then you just scrape the adhesive off and leaves you a, a, a surface to, um, to add any other surface coatings or coverings over the top of this. So here you can see a uh, disc cutter. They've already marked out where the reinforcement is as well so they avoid it. And because the, uh, the adhesive um, has reduced fillers in there, um, so that we can get the plates and slot them in and the adhesive extrudes easily, then it's also useful that you can actually place the adhesive into a traditional sealant bolt gun. So you can see here, it's very easily and controllable to get it into the, uh, into the slot. And then you see where the plate's been pushed into the top and then say we've just scraped the top off, let it cure and uh, job done really. Mentioned in the um, when I spoke the um, the sort of the history of uh, external plate bonding, how important the uh, glass transition temperature is, and uh, in certain situations we need to raise that temperature. And uh, what we can do, we can do this on site, and we have what's called a heating device. And um, so carbodur is is applied to the to the underside of the structure. Because the carbon fibre is conductive, then we can actually apply a current through there to heat the plate, which subsequently heats the adhesive. And then we start to post-cure the adhesive, which then raises the glass transition temperature from just over 40 degrees, anything up to 100 degrees. Also, this technique is quite useful when you're working in the winter time. Um, it, just, it still allows you to actually apply the product uh, in quite cold conditions. So if you look at traditionally with, with the product that we use for uh, still for the, for the um, carbon fibre plate bonding, normally at seven days at 23 degrees, you'll end up with a TG of around about 45 degrees. If you then use the same product, maybe at a warmer temperature, maybe the Middle East, and you're looking at 35 degrees, your glass transition temperature will be increased to 55. The advantage of the, the heater is that two hours at 80 degrees, you'll get a glass transition of 72 and then, let's say, up to 100 degrees C. So that can be quite uh, useful, especially where we strengthening um, process areas where you've got quite high temperatures uh, internally. Start to look at structural fabrics now. And uh, again, we've uh, there are carbon, glass, and also aramid. And these the way that this weave is, is what we call, it's unidirectional, so all the sort of filaments of the fibres go in one direction, and then you have a sort of a synthetic thread which allows them to form this type of weave. We also have bidirectional fabrics, which is, fab which is where the filaments are going in two directions, uh, 90 degrees to each other, and if they're going across the fabric, that's what we call the weft. If they're going along the length of the fabric, then that's called the actual warp. And then we've also got other 
unidirectional products which are stitched in a different way. So when you start to add all these combinations of, you, you need quite an array of different, uh, different products, but we tend to standardise our product range at the moment um, based on sort of the, the, the basic products. There are hybrids uh, available and we're looking at of combining uh, carbon <coughs> with uh, glass fibre, carbon with, um, with aramids, bidirectional, sort of directional at 45 degrees for, for various different situations. Installation, you have the fabrics plus the resins. <coughs> Um, two processes. The first one is what we call the wet process. What happens here is that there is a, a roller installed at the end of what we call a saturating machine. Uh, this is what's called a resin bath. It's two-part um, epoxy. <coughs> so at the other side of the machine is another roller <coughs> and that's fed round like a mangle. So as this passes through the resin bath, this, this is dry, but as it passes through, this, uh, the fabric's wet. And then the dry process, you actually apply the adhesive to the substrate to start with, then you apply the fabric, and then if you want more layers, you apply adhesive, fabric, adhesive, and fabric. Concrete substrate preparation and testing, similar to what we've done with steel plate bonding, grip blasting, remove any dust, and to get a surface sort of pull off around about two newtons per millimetre squared. With the wet process, when, it, when the, um, the material comes off the saturator, it's applied to the structure, and then it's generally rolled, whether it's overhead, or as you can see here, vertically, and then overlapped. And then you can work up and down, or lengthways, crossways, uh, a structure. Quite a messy process. Contractors don't particularly like it. Um, inevitably, you're going to get a few creases in the uh, in the fabric. So again, you use you know your gloved hand. You've got to sort of iron those out. The, the big advantage to this, though, is that because you get covered in so much resin, you get a sort of Wallace and Gromit trousers situation where in the morning they're already standing waiting for you to uh, to get into them. The dry process, quite simply, um, the fabric just comes out of the box. Adhesive is mixed up, applied to the structure, and then the layers are applied. As Neil mentioned, a special roller that applies pressure to the fabric, which, which then the roller splits the fibres, which allows the adhesive to come through. <coughs> then you apply the next layer, depending on the, uh, the design on how many layers are required. And then, to reduce the sort of visual impact um, of, the, of the strengthening, or to sort of give some protection from UV, we've got coatings that we can apply over the top which are compatible to, uh, to hide the strengthening. When we start to look at compression strengthening <coughs> or, or confinement, uh, then again, wet or dry. But you can see here, this is uh, a structure that's sort of uh, been partially completed before we've actually uh, applied a protective coating over the top. And uh, there's another, another one there where you can see the beams have been strengthened and, uh, and also confinement of those columns as well. End plate anchorage can be carried out two ways. One with the seeker wrap. So it wraps around the ends of the plates. Or we can use the carbon shear links which act connecting shear as well as end anchorage of these plates as well. So they sort of have a, a, a double usage really. And then what we have is, uh, is we can use two products in combination. It's, uh, it's a fabric plus it's a, a cord as well, again for, uh, for anchorage. So that is the cord around about 10 metres. It's uh, lots of in individual filaments which have been bound into a, a roving. And then there's several rovings that's covered then in a plastic sheath. You drill a hole in the concrete, you push the sheath in, remove, and then you, pu you, you pull off the, the plastic um, sheath around, and then you splay the ends to give you anchorage. And this is probably better explained here where you've got um, an I-beam, which where you can't obviously use uh, the carbon shear links, but you can use the fabric to go around the contours of the beam. And then where this cord has been used, it's been drilled in, and then it's been splayed at the ends here, 
and that, um, that forms the anchorage to that, uh, that shear design. And you can see um, the, the fabric here for, uh, for shear as well on the ends of these beams. Seismic uh, retrofitting. First of all, you've got to understand what the problem is. Is it going to be uh, flexural or is it going to be buckling? And that will determine which method you start to, uh, start to review. So there's several ways. If it's masonry, you can use what's called the grid configuration where we can use the, uh, the carbon over plates. And, and then there's the X-frame where we can use uh, strips and use them as uh, diagonal. And of course, this is the passive situation <coughs> not the, um, the active way that um, Fabio was talking about. But obviously you have to lock the plates into the concrete structure as you do with, with the fabrics and, uh, as well. And with the fabrics we can also anchor in with the, uh, with the rope. Quality control, again of the adhesives, particularly for the plates, exactly the same as we had for the steel plates, BD 3094, use a flexural modulus, lap shear strength, tensile shear strength, nothing changes there. The contractors are used to doing these tests. We have the test houses that can test anywhere over the country and carry out these tests. And because they're uh, epoxy products and they gain strength very quickly, you're not waiting 28 days perhaps like you are with uh, concrete cubes for the final strength. You get the final strength within a few days. And then the hammer testing, or more sophisticated way, is to use what's called an automatic tap tester or a woodpecker, it's known in, in the trade. This has been developed really by the military because um, when boats, military boats, get hold, or if a plane is in combat and gets damaged, what they do is they come in uh, for repair especially the, 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 the aircraft, they get repaired very quickly within probably four or five hours and they just need to establish that they've got a, a, a really good sort of repair and everything's been sort of, all the resin's been in, in sort of infused between the fibres <coughs> and again, very simple test, but we can adopt this to, to the plates because uh, uh, what we can do is we can mark a grid out and then we can then just use these three uh, heads They'll hit the, t hit the plate, and then that will be data logged into this uh, logging device there, in which then um, you, you can hook up to a, to a computer. But not used very often, that's quite a good test in itself. If, if you find a few problems, perhaps it may be worth looking at that. But also, there are other, other tests as well. Adhesion test pull-off here. What you can do, what you couldn't do with the steel plates, is you can test the whole system. So you can have a sacrificial plate uh, on the structure, which you're quite willing to sort of destruct, and you can core through the plate and, and, uh, and then do a pull-off of the whole system, which is quite a useful uh, thing to do. So the other test has been covered by Neil as well, uh, with um, TR57, shearography, ultrasonics, etc. And the same you can do with the laminates as well. So you, um, we tend to just go for the adhesive pull-off because it's a lot more difficult to sort of quality test through for flexure and, and modulus and everything with, a, with an unfilled resin. So this is another way of making sure that it's all working uh, with your design and also with the structure. Again, similar tests you can really probe into if you need to, but um, <coughs> traditionally you just use a, a, a pull-off test and that can tell you a lot of information. Okay, just a few selection now of international case studies. This is the uh, UK, start off with the UK first. This is the first FRP strengthening project in the UK. It was uh, undertaken by ourselves, uh, supplying the, the, uh, the materials. And again, here looking at increased floor uh, loading, so it's a flexural situation, and we use 1.3 kilometres of, uh, of plates. Basically what they were doing is they were applying a uh, magnetic resonance imaging, imaging machine on top of the floor and with those machines they're actually quite heavy plus you do get quite a bit of vibration uh, off them as well and this was quite a, a useful uh, way of um, strengthening the, the beams. 
Now, somebody mentioned fire resistance earlier. And what they did with this structure in particular, they then put a false ceiling across the top, which was um, which satisfies the um, the fire regulations anyway. So you didn't get the exposure, that, that would be the barrier to any sort of uh, fire that developed and protection to those, uh, to those plates. Uh, this is a, a bridge in Manchester, needed uh, upgraded to 40 tonne loading. And again, you can see the carbon system here used in a, uh, a slightly different uh, situation and the way that this has been anchored at, uh, at the ends with, uh, with, with, a, with a plate and, and a bolt. It's Hailing Island, again, flexural strengthening, a carbon dust system was used. And again, this shows the importance of having an adhesive that has very low water absorption because it's used in a, in a marine environment. A uh, project in Bengio, uh, which is in Hertfordshire, uh, water tower, and they just strengthen the outside of the, uh, of, of the tower using uh, the carbon dust using the carbon strips. This is London Underground. These are the bespoke plates we looked at uh, earlier on. And you basically have four hours to do anything within the, the tunnel. So that's from getting your equipment in, sort of placing your access and support system in place, carrying out the works. And that included, obviously, the grip blasting of the, um, of the, of the girders and corrosion protection on those girders and then these plates were installed all had to be done within four hours per stage this was a column uh, on a motorway bridge and uh, really they were looking at sort of impact resistance and we used um, an aramid uh, in this situation this is Germany uh, what they found, they had uh, insufficient reinforcement in the bottom of these um, <coughs> balconies because they span from this wall to the next wall. And just a very simple solution was three strips on each balcony. This is one in Italy, similar situation, except because it was a cantilevered uh, balcony, then the carbido was placed in the, the top. See there? And each balcony, once it had been strengthened, was load tested as well with uh, cement bags. Uh, there, we, there we go. Um, so this was strengthening of a shear wall. And you can see here where the plates have actually been placed diagonally on the masonry. So again, as far as preparation is concerned for the masonry, grip blasted. Obviously, in the mortar joints, <coughs> if they're recessed, they have to be sort of filled and levelled uh, before you apply the adhesive and the plates. And then the plates are anchored in where the columns are. This is Malaysia. Uh, there's two uh, bridges. This was the first bridge in uh, Penang. Uh, there was a, a fire uh, and um, caused problems, not only obviously to the concrete, but also to the steel reinforcement as well. <coughs> so as um, well it did repair the concrete and then applied the carbodeur where the damage had actually occurred. New Zealand, uh, at the time it was the world's largest single span bridge built in 1910 um, and it was upgraded for seismic, flexural and, and shear. A lot of start, sort of new codes have started to be introduced into Asia in regards to sort of seismic movement and you can see here the plates that were applied to the beams and uh, a shot I showed earlier on with quite a complex sort of a, an array of uh, carbon shear links. Indonesia again for seismic um, for seismic loading they'd found that this building under the current codes didn't really comply so basically every floor had to be strengthened from the basement upwards to the uh, to the roof so each column was basically um, wrapped in the seeker, fibre, uh, seeker wrap carbon fibre and also certain parts of the building on the beams as well. This is a bridge in Switzerland, uh, quite a historic bridge, you can tell by the date, 1807, and uh, wanted to increase from a fairly low load of 12 up to, uh, up to 20 tonnes. And you can see here that um, a lot of the plates were bonded to the bottom of the, of the timber, three to four plates, on each uh, crossbeam, 
And again, preparation on the timber, <coughs> grip blasted, and hopefully if it's sound timber, then um, it provides a really good, uh, a good surface to bond to. Uh, this is a cooling tower in Poland. You can see there's been quite a lot of uh, damage to the, to the legs here. So there had to be some repairs carried out, R4 repair, using the monotop repair system. <coughs> and then once they'd been carried out, it was then a case of strengthening each of the legs. Now, because normally at the cooling towers there's quite a lot of moisture, these um, legs would contain quite a bit of moisture anyway, and, and obviously they've been corroding because of that. So what you don't want to do is to fully encapsulate the legs. So you allow gaps between the strengthening, because you want those legs to dry out to a certain extent, but also what you don't want to do is to actually induce corrosion as well with the amount of moisture that you've actually locked in. So then we then apply a protective coating to the outside, which is also breathable, that allows that moisture to, um, to sort of uh, evaporate from the, uh, from the legs. Columbia, historic masonry chimney. Again, strengthening purely for uh, seismic loading. And uh, what they've done here is, first of all, prepare, prepare the, uh, the masonry in the line where they're going to strengthen. Uh, then they apply a, a levelling mortar, generally sort of uh, epoxy-based levelling mortar, and then they applied seeker uh, wrap fabric, cut to uh, the dimensions you can see here, uh, by the dry method, and then it was uh, coated with a, with a clear coating. So they actually used this <coughs> technique and this design to actually sort of, I suppose, improve it aesthetically a little bit, but it made it quite interesting as a, as a chimney. In the past, chimneys have been strengthened using steel hoops, but of course you all know what happens to those. They tend to, uh, to corrode and cause all sorts of other issues. <coughs> As Neil mentioned earlier on, we're offering uh, today a um, conceptual design tool. Leave your details with uh, Kerry and, and Deb at the back, and uh, we'll take the details away with us, and um, we will send you a link. And then when you activate that link, uh, you then wait, have to wait for an activation code. could take a couple of days because it has to go to Switzerland. They're starting to be inundated with hundreds of requests, I think, so uh, have a little bit of patience. Uh, that would be great. And then you can start to use the, uh, the tool. So when, when we send you the link, we'll also send a, a, a user guide as well, so you can have a look at that to start with. But again, we would like to stress that it is purely a conceptual tool. It doesn't comply with TR55 with regards to the new anchorage um, requirements and, and also the near surface mounted plates. But it's a starter for 10. Yeah, it's a, a good feasibility, f feasibility stool, uh, tool. And then if you need any more detail, obviously there's people like um, Neil around or you may have that experience within your uh, design team anyway. Okay, so um, thank you for your attention. <coughs>